What's going on guys, this is Rob. Uh, if you guys enjoy my content, make sure you hit the subscribe button and make sure you hit that little bell so you never miss out on my sexy voice. Okay, you guys have been screaming at me in the comment section to cover this story. And so we are going to. Originally, I was going to upload a different story today, but we're actually going to postpone that till next week because uh, it's not nearly as important. And we're going to cover the Immortal Hulk. Now, the Immortal Hulk is basically the return of Bruce Banner as the Incredible Hulk in Marvel Comics, which his absence had really been felt. It was like the Fantastic Four not being there, right? It's just kind of like, I mean, you can't, it was weird they decided to kill him off during Civil War. And then it was like, I don't know why you would like, wow, well, like who thought that was a good idea? I guess it was Bennett's good idea. Now he's writing Superman. So we'll see how that plays out. But uh, but nonetheless, you know, it's 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 cool to see the Incredible Hulk return. Now, what this does is this initially picks up with a kid named Tommy. And Tommy actually knocks over a gas station, which is coincidentally run by Roxxon Oil. Uh, those of you guys who don't know what Roxxon Oil is, it's like the most corrupt organization in the entirety of Marvel Comics. <laughs> they, are, they are your Marvel stand-in for your traditional corrupt corporation. They have their hands on everything, like slave trading and all kinds of stuff. They're a very, very sinister organization. But Tommy butts into this place, and this robbery goes exactly as you would expect because the way this is done whenever it comes to robbery there's only ever two kinds there's basically people who are confident about it people who have done it before and those who are brand new tommy is brand new to the whole to the whole gas station robbery scene and you can hear it you can tell by the way his voice is going the fact that he's trembling he's unsure of himself the guy looks terrified and he's sweating and then what happens is there's a young girl named sandy who's in there she's 12 years old and she drops a glass and when she does tommy freaks out and shoots her now this happens directly in front of bruce banner this leads to the incredible hope beginning to manifest itself which leads to Tommy shooting Bruce Banner in the head. Now, this is kind of an important thing. And the reason why is because one of the arguments that people make on how to kill the Incredible Hulk is to kill Bruce Banner. This is actually going to answer that question. And it's going to be a little bit of a trump card that Al Ewing throws in here in order to bring the Incredible Hulk back. When Tommy takes off and he ends up, you know, shooting the cashier and bails out, we end up picking up with a morgue shortly after this. Now, this does deal with a detective named Gloria as well as a reporter named Jackie. And it's kind of cool because they're basically trying to figure out who done this. Now, initially, there's no real significance to them, right? Like Jackie's just a reporter covering a story uh, about a gas station robbery and Gloria is a detective who's you know trying to figure the whole thing out but with regards to Bruce Banner himself despite the fact that he's essentially dead the Incredible Hulk manifests itself now I want to say that something like this happened during Peter David's run not going to swear to it but as far as I'm aware in the history of Marvel Comics the rule of thumb when it came to Banner's impending death and the Incredible Hulk was that the Hulk would manifest right at the point when Banner was going to die so if you go and you read like the Incredible Hulk the end for example Banner throws himself off a cliff and and then the Incredible Hulk manifests in order to save Banner. This is kind of a break from tradition. The fact that, that Bruce Banner can basically be dead, can be diagnosed, you know, can literally be dead in an autopsy, you know, prepared to be performed. And then sometime later, presumably maybe an hour later, manifests as the Incredible Hulk. You never really see that. It's a way to just kind of invoke, invoke the Hulk and bring him back. And so what this does is this picks up with a biker gang. And this is when we realize the story is a little more tragic than it originally appeared in the sense that Tommy is actually in debt to a biker gang just to keep the lights on, quite literally. Like he's not really able to pay the light bill. He's got a family to support. He's doing whatever it takes in order to make sure that they have the resources they need. And because he's in debt to this biker gang, he's been knocking over gas stations in order to pay back what he owes and so he's basically like this guy who's caught in an impossible situation now this leads to the incredible hulk showing up and basically massacring everybody and this is exactly what you would expect i mean none of them are prepared i mean it's, it's it's just this giant green rage monster showing up and just snatching people up smashing their bones i mean bullets are being sprayed in every direction and none of it makes a difference because when the guns are going off tommy's fleeing for his life people are screaming and when the when when the screaming stops then suddenly tommy turns around and he's basically he comes face to face with the incredible hulk himself and this is cool because the way that al ewing kind of plays this out it's almost like a horror film and that's really kind of what you would expect with the incredible hulk right like if you really get down to like the great incredible hulk stories a lot of them do focus on the hulk himself tearing things up and smashing things because at the end of the day all anybody ever really wants to see the incredible hulk do is just smash stuff i mean it's not unreasonable <laughs> that's why his catchphrase is hulk smash because we just want to see him destroy things like that's, that's what the incredible hulk does you know but it's, it's kind of interesting because in this instance the incredible hulk is almost merciless and that's why i say this is like like savage i mean savage hulk will make his return in the story but he's really very very dark and merciless here because tommy tries to explain the situation and say look you know i'm, I'm a guy who's caught in an impossible situation you know that i didn't mean for it to happen but at the end of the day it doesn't matter the incredible hulk's response is who cares what your intention was you walked into a gas station with a loaded gun you had no idea what you were doing you pulled the trigger out of desperation and panic and you shot a 12 year old girl and killed her you my friend are in a world of hurt and where where Tommy put you know turns the gun on the Incredible Hulk and shoots him, it doesn't make a difference. And so he kind of asks this question. He says, you know, I'm not a bad guy, am I? And the Incredible Hulk responds, what do you think? And literally breaks 
every single bone in his body. And from the way it's told, a giant crater is left outside of a hospital indicating either the Incredible Hulk just crumpled Tommy like a piece of paper, just wadded him up, and then took him to the hospital and dropped him off, or he just threw him at the hospital and just threw him into the ground. Regardless of the scenario, Tommy will probably never walk again, and he'll probably never wake up again. He's essentially going to be in a vegetative state forever. But where you have Gloria and you have Jackie who are having a conversation trying to figure out what's going on, Gloria and Jackie are friends. And so Gloria ultimately spills the beans and says, look, you didn't hear this from me, but the rumor here, the statement here, at least from what we're understanding from these bikers who have confessed, from the ones who were left alive anyway, the way this is being told is that Tommy didn't do this, that there was somebody who showed up with in, an insane amount of strength and he was giant and he was green. And that's when they start to debate. They're like, Bruce Banner was shot and killed by Hawkeye. He's dead. He's not supposed to be back. And they're like, but yes, he is though. There's really no denying this point as an absolute truth that he really is back and he really is alive. And so it's, it's kind of interesting to see because you end up having this, this really cool scenario where Jackie's going through and doing a series of interviews, you know, talking to various people, getting a feel for their stories about the Incredible Hulk. And basically all the stories they give is that the Incredible Hulk is almost like this, this mythological being. He's like this mythological force that exists out there that a lot of people have seen him, but it's like he's there and gone. And people don't walk up to him because they're terrified. And so in their response, in their mind, it is this guy is, is he's like a mythical beast that exists out there, but I'm not going to tell you anything about him. It's like, it's like the old, it's like the classic Sicilian argument or a Sicilian statement for, for like the mafia, right? Like I didn't see anything because I wasn't home. And if I was home, I still didn't see anything because I was asleep. Like it's, it's, it's really how this whole thing plays out when it comes to like people who have encountered him being terrified by him. A couple people were kind of enamored and that's why there's mixed stories here because the story is like, well, the Incredible Hulk helped people, different things like that. So it's, it's a little bit fluctuating here. Now from here, we switch directly over to, uh, to Jackie going through her research and, and so on looking at these stories when she's suddenly met by Walter Lankowski. Now, Walter Lankowski is a character that we've never really talked about before and we've never really had a reason to. But when it comes to the character of Sasquatch, he's been around for a long, long time. The old Alpha Flight story, well, really, he goes all the way back to Uncanny X-Men 120, I think way back in the day. He goes back quite some time. Now, the idea behind this, here's kind of the cool thing. The idea behind the introduction of Walter Lankowski was that at the time, going really going all the way back to Uncanny X-Men number 109, the idea was that the there was an attempt that was made by Alpha Flight, which was Canada's uh, superhero team that was monitored by the government in Department H. The idea was that they wanted to bring Wolverine back into the fold because Wolverine had previously been part of Alpha Flight. What you had is you had uh, Alpha Flight traveling to try to find a way to kidnap Wolverine and bring him back. And that really kind of led into a little more fleshing out of Logan's backstory and, and so on and so forth. But the way this originally played out, if you go back and you read Alpha Flight issues 23 and 20, 24. I'm not going to swear by that, although I guess I should be right since this is comics explained. Uh, if you go back and you read the old Alpha Flight stories, the way it played out, and really it's kind of an origin that Al Ewing runs over again here. It's not super important, but he kind of runs over again here. The notion was that Canada was looking for its own version of uh, the Incredible Hulk, basically. Because the first time the Incredible Hulk showed up in Canada, they sent Wolverine after him. And really, Wolverine was defeated for the most part. And so the question was, okay, they need their own superhero team to defeat the Incredible Hulk, kind of an answer to that version of his character. And so you ended up, they ended up bringing in Sasquatch, and they basically bombarded Walter Lankowski with gamma rays and turned him into the Sasquatch character. The difference here is that back then in the old Alpha Flight stories, what you had was basically a portal that would open. And so when Walter Lankowski became Sasquatch, what he was doing is he was switching uh, places with a being called Tanarak. Now, Tanarak was one of these like early beasts that existed in Marvel Comics that, that was really in like a different dimension, but always tried to invade Earth. And over the years in Marvel Comics, at least in the early days, running really throughout the 19, uh, 19 1970s and 1980s, Tanarak would switch places. So when Walter Lankowski became Sasquatch, it would allow for just a little more control each time by Tanarak until Tanarak fully seized control of Walter and took over his body entirely. Now, of course, this led to Songbird basically destroying Tanarak, but Tanarak had been dead for a long, long time. And that meant that it was basically Walter who was always in control whenever he became Sasquatch. He was always doing his own thing, but he was supremely strong. He was incredibly capable in his, in his various abilities. And of course, that led to him being one of the many legitimate challenges for the Incredible Hulk. Now, where you end up having like this bar fight that breaks out basically between Walter Lankowski and like a whole bunch of crazy guys, this of course leads to him being stabbed, which leads to him going to the hospital. In and of itself, this is not wildly important. The reason why this matters is because what ends up happening here is Bruce Banner goes and speaks directly to Jackie. And when she does, he basically tells her this whole thing is happening in the middle of the night. The clock is about to strike midnight. And when that happens, he's going to turn into Sasquatch again. When he does turn into Sasquatch, it will 
not be Walter Lankowski who is in control, it'll be the other guy. And because Bruce Banner doesn't really know about the idea that Tanarak is no longer part of the picture, in his mind, he believes Tanarak will be the one to seize control. And so that's when he tells Jackie, you have to evacuate the hospital, you have to get everybody out of here, because if you don't, everybody's going to die. And that's when Walter begins to sort of retransform again, begins to kind of push to the next phase, and then suddenly he ends up just having his, he really just kind of takes on this form that is almost identical to the old Tanarak character. And so it's kind of crazy, because it seems like Tanarak is essentially back. Now this leads into a massive fight between the two groups, when really the Incredible Hulk takes over and goes through and just starts tearing everything up. Now, Bruce Banner is the one who tries to approach Walter and try to talk reason into him, but this is when, you know, Tanarak basically like slashes Bruce Banner's throat and says, you know, I don't want to talk to you, I want to talk to the other guy. And so Bruce Banner basically manages manifesting the Incredible Hulk, and the two of them start going at it. Now, this is when things get cool, because on the surface, we would write this off as just a retelling of the old 1970s Incredible Hulk stories with, like, the Incredible Hulk versus, uh, versus Sasquatch, and that would be it. What happens is Al Ewing actually switches it up, and where you end up having him believing, like, where he ends up asking the question, are you possessed by, like, Mephisto or Tanarak or something like that, the response here is, I'm neither of those guys. I'm the person you're terrified of the most. And we end up finding out the the body of Walter, Walter Lankowski is actually possessed by the father, by Brian. Brian Banner, the father of Bruce. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, when it comes to Bruce Banner's character, over the years, a hallmark of his character was that he was he was the child of an abusive father. But a lot of that really comes out of like Bill Mantlo and Peter David's runs of the Incredible Hulk. Because back then in those stories, they fleshed out the idea that like the Incredible Hulk persona was a result of like all the torment, guilt, and 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 hatred and rage that Bruce Banner felt at being victimized by his father so frequently. And so his father played a major role in the stories, especially under Peter David. But when you're talking about those two runs being combined, it, it caused all kinds of crazy situations, and it really introduced some really cool concepts in terms of how Bruce Banner viewed his father, and how he viewed himself. But where you end up having Bruce Banner walking around with like a victim's mindset, and really almost like kind of panics for a moment, he basically starts lashing out. But what ends up happening is the Incredible Hulk kind of splits the difference, right? He sits down and he says, you know, in, in a matter of seconds, you know, in his own mind, he sits down and he says, Bruce Banner's the one that's afraid of his father. I'm the Incredible Hulk. I'm not afraid of anybody. The Incredible Hulk is the strongest there is. And this is when he makes the switch. And, and the Incredible Hulk stops being Incredible Hulk and turns back into Savage Hulk. And when he does, he absolutely goes toe-to-toe -to -toe with Sasquatch. Now remember, Sasquatch was designed to be the Canadian version of the Incredible Hulk, minus the unlimited strength. And so Sasquatch is able to readily hold his own and does quite well. I mean, literally you have, you know, Brian Banner in the body of, of Walter doing exactly what he does and, and ripping them apart. The difference here is that Brian Banner did not count on the one thing that we almost never see from the Incredible Hulk. The Incredible Hulk's response being, I eat gamma radiation. When it comes to the Incredible Hulk, because he consumes gamma radiation, anything that, that emits gamma radiation, he can essentially feed off of. You're basically putting him in front of a buffet. And because of the fact that Sasquatch is bombarded with gamma radiation, the Incredible Hulk basically absorbs the entire Sasquatch persona unto himself, and then in turn, leaves Walter Lankowski with no powers whatsoever. And so what he ends up doing is speaking directly to Jackie herself. And this is kind of cool. He asks Jackie the question, he says, you're a local reporter reporter in some small town somewhere, but you've decided to follow me all the way here. So the question I have is, why are you here? What are you looking for? And Jackie's response is, I want to be like you. Like, I want to have the power that you have. I want to be a version of the Incredible Hulk. Now, of course, this leads to the, the, to the Hulk basically walking away and saying, go home, do your own thing. But it's kind of crazy because it introduces the idea that someone is intentionally chasing after to becoming the Incredible Hulk, which is not something you normally see. But where you end up having Walter Lankowski saying, like, the Sasquatch persona is gone. It's no longer a part of him anymore. When Bruce Banner is basically walking away, it's, it's essentially this really cool idea where Al Ewing does a throwback to the old Peter David and Bill Mantlo stories where the Incredible Hulk has reabsorbed the personality of his father. He's reabsorbed his father's ghost. And so this is one of those things where it returns to the old style of Incredible Hulk storytelling back when it was more character driven, where you basically had the Incredible Hulk dealing with the torment of his father, giving him all kinds of hell and, and wreaking havoc inside of his head. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoy this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.